Section 6 of The Golden Slipper and Other Problems for Violet Strange. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Golden Slipper and Other Problems for Violet Strange by Anna Catherine Green. Section 6, Problem 5, Part 1, The Dreaming Lady. And this is all you mean to tell me? I think you will find it quite enough, Miss Strange. Just the address, and this advice, that your call be speedy. Distracted nerves cannot wait. Violet, across whose wonted piquancy there lay an indefinable shadow, eyed her employer with a doubtful air before turning away toward the door. She had asked him for a case to investigate, something she had never done before, and she had even gone so far as to particularize the sort of case she desired. It must be an interesting one, she had stipulated, but different, quite different from the last one. It must not involve death or any kind of horror. If you have a case of subtlety without crime, one to engage my powers without depressing my spirits, I beg you to let me have it. I, I have not felt quite like myself since I came from Massachusetts. Whereupon, without further comment, but with a smile she did not understand, he had handed her a small slip of paper on which he had scribbled an address. She should have felt satisfied, but for some reason she did not. She regarded him as capable of plunging her into an affair quite the reverse of what she felt herself in a condition to undertake. "'I should like to know a little more,' she pursued, making a move to unfold the slip he had given her. But he stopped her with a gesture. "'Read it in your limousine,' he said. "'If you are disappointed then, let me know, but I think you will find yourself quite ready for your task.' "'And my father?' would approve if he could be got to approve the business at all. You do not even need to take your brother with you. Oh, then, it's with women only I have to deal. Read the address after you're headed up Fifth Avenue. But when, with her doubts not yet entirely removed, she opened the small slip he had given her, the number inside suggested nothing but the fact that her destination lay somewhere near 80th Street. It was therefore with the keenest surprise she beheld her motor stop before the conspicuous house of the great financier whose late death had so affected the money market. She had not had any acquaintance with this man herself, but she knew his house. Everyone knew that. It was one of the most princely in the whole city. C. Dudley Brooks had known how to spend his millions. Indeed, he had known how to do this so well that it was of him her father, also a financier of some note, had once said he was the only successful American he envied. She was expected. That she saw the instant the door was opened. This made her entrance easy, an entrance further brightened by the delightful glimpse of a child's cherubic face looking at her from a distant doorway. It was an instantaneous vision, gone as soon as seen, but its effect was to rob the pillared spaces of the wonderful hallway of some of their chill and to modify in some slight degree the formality of a service which demanded three men to usher her into a small reception room not twenty feet from the door of entrance. Left in this secluded spot, she had time to ask herself what member of the household she would be called upon to meet, and was surprised to find that she did not even know of whom the household consisted. She was sure of the fact that Mr. Brooks had been a widower for many years before his death, but beyond that she knew nothing of his domestic life. His son. But was there a son? She had never heard any mention made of the younger Mr. Brooks, yet there was certainly someone of his connection who enjoyed the rights of an heir. Him she must be prepared to meet with due composure, whatever astonishment he might show at the sight of a slip of a girl instead of the experienced detective he had every right to expect. But when the door opened to admit the person she was awaiting, the surprise was hers. It was a woman who stood before her a woman and an oddity. Yet, in just what her oddity lay, Violet found it difficult to decide. Was it in the smoothness of her white locks drawn carefully down over her ears, or in the contrast afforded by her eager eyes and her weak and tremulous mouth? She was dressed in the heaviest of mourning and very expensively, but there was that in her bearing and expression which made it impossible to believe that she took any interest in her garments, or even knew in which of her dresses she had been attired. "'I am the person you have come here to see,' she said. "'Your name is not unfamiliar to me, but you may not know mine. "'It is Quintard, Mrs. Quintard. "'I am in difficulty. 
I need assistance, secret assistance. I did not know where to go for it except to a detective agency, so I telephoned to the first one I saw advertised, and, and I was told to expect Miss Strange. But I didn't think it would be you, though, I suppose it's all right. You have come here for this purpose, haven't you, though it does seem a little queer. Certainly, Mrs. Quintard, and if you will tell me... My dear, it's just this. Yes, I will sit down. Last week, my brother died. You have heard of him, no doubt. See Dudley Brooks? Oh, yes, my father knew him. We all knew him by reputation. Do not hurry, Mrs. Quintard. I have sent my car away. You can take all the time you wish. No, no, I cannot. I'm in desperate haste. He, but let me go on with my story. My brother was a widower with no children to inherit. That everybody knows. But his wife left behind her a son by a former husband. And this son of hers, my brother had in a measure adopted, and even made his sole heir in a will he drew up during the lifetime of his wife. But when he found, as he very soon did, that this young man was not developing in a way to meet such great responsibilities, he made a new will, though unhappily without the knowledge of the family, or even of his most intimate friends, in which he gave the bulk of his great state to his nephew Clement who has bettered the promise of his youth, and who besides has children of great beauty whom my brother had learned to love. And this will, this hoarded scrap of paper which means so much to us all, is lost, lost, and I, here, her voice which had risen almost to a scream, sank to a horrified whisper. I'm the one who lost it. But there is a copy of it somewhere, there is always a copy. Oh, but you haven't heard it all. My nephew is an invalid has been an invalid for years. That's why so little is known about him. He's dying of consumption. The doctors hold out no hope for him. And now, with the fear of preying upon him, of leaving his wife and children penniless, he is wearing away, so fast that any hour may see his end. And I have yet to meet his eyes, such pitiful eyes, and the look in them is killing me. Yet I was not to blame. I could not help... Oh, Miss Strange... She suddenly broke in with the inconsequence of extreme feeling. This will is in the house. I never carried it off the floor where I sleep. Find it, find it, I pray, oh. The moment had come for Violet's soft touch, for Violet's encouraging word. I will try, she answered her. Mrs. Quintard grew calmer. But first, the young girl continued, I must know more about the conditions. Where is this nephew of yours, the man who is ill? in this house, where he has been for the last eight months. Was the child his of whom I caught a glimpse in the hall as I came in? Yes, and I will fight for that child, Violet cried out impulsively. I am sure his father's cause is good. Where is the other claimant, the one you designate as Carlos? Oh, that's where the trouble is. Carlos is on the Mauritania, and she is due here in a couple of days. He comes from the east, where he has been touring with his wife. Miss Strange, the lost will must be found before then, or the other will be reopened and read, and Carlos made master of this house, which would mean our quick departure and Clement's certain death. Move a sick man? A relative, as low as you say he is? Oh no, Mrs. Quintard, no one would do that, were the house a cabin and its owners paupers. You do not know Carlos, you do not know his wife. We should not be given a week in which to pack. They have no children, and they envy Clement, who has. Our only hope lies in discovering the paper which gives us the right to remain here in face of all opposition. That or penury. You know my trouble now. And it is trouble, one from which I shall make every effort to relieve you. But first let me ask you if you are not worrying unnecessarily about this missing document. If it was drawn up by Mr. Brooks's lawyer. But it was not, that lady impetuously interrupted. His lawyer is Carlos's near relative, and has never been told of the change in my brother's intentions. Clement, I am speaking now of my brother and not of my nephew, was a great money-getter, but when it came to standing up for his rights in domestic matters, he was more timid than a child. He was subject to his wife while she lived, and when she was gone, to her relatives, who are all of dominating character. When he finally made up his mind to do us justice and eliminate Carlos, he went out of town. I wish I could remember where and had this will drawn up by a stranger whose name I cannot recall. 
Her shaking tones, her nervous manner betrayed a weakness equaling, if not surpassing, that of the brother who dared in secret what he had not strength to acknowledge openly. And it was with some hesitation Violet prepared to ask those definite questions which would elucidate the cause and manner of a loss seemingly so important. She dreaded to hear some commonplace tale of inexcusable carelessness. Something subtler than this, the presence of some unsuspected agency opposed to young Clement's interest, some partisan of Carlos, some secret undermining force in a house full of servants and dependents, seemed necessary for the development of so ordinary a situation into a drama justifying the exercise of her special powers. I think I understand now your exact position in the house, as well as the value of the paper which you say you have lost. The next thing for me to hear is how you came to have charge of this paper, and under what circumstances you were led to mislay it. Do you not feel quite ready to tell me? Is it necessary? Mrs. Quintard faltered. Very, replied Violet, watching her curiously. I didn't expect... That is, I hoped you would be able to point out, by some power we cannot, of course, explain, just the spot where the paper lies, without having to tell all that. Some people can, you know. Oh, I understand. You regarded me as unfit for practical work, and so credited me with occult powers. But that is where you made a mistake, Mrs. Quintard. I am nothing if not practical. And let me add, that I am as secret as the grave concerning what my clients tell me. If I am to be of any help to you, I must be made acquainted with every fact involved in the loss of this valuable paper. Relate the whole circumstance or dismiss me from the case. You can have done nothing more foolish or wrong than many— Oh, don't say things like that, broke in the poor woman in a tone of great indignation. I have done nothing anyone could call either foolish or wicked. I am simply very unfortunate, and being sensitive. But this isn't telling the story. I'll try to make it all clear. But if I do not, and show any confusion— Stop me and help me out with questions. I, oh, where should I begin? With your first knowledge of the second will. Thank you, thank you. Now I can go on. One night, shortly after my brother had been given up by the physicians, I was called to his bedside for a confidential talk. As he had received that day a very large amount of money from the bank, I thought he was going to hand it over to me for Clement, but it was for something much more serious than this that he had summoned me. When he was quite sure that we were alone and nobody anywhere within hearing, he told me that he had changed his mind as to the disposal of his property, and that it was to Clement and his children, and not to Carlos, he was going to leave this house and the bulk of his money. That he had had a new will drawn up, which he showed me. Showed you? Yes, he made me bring it to him from the safe where he kept it, and feeble as he was, he was so interested in pointing out certain portions of it, that he lifted himself in bed and was so strong and animated that I thought he was getting better. But it was a false strength due to the excitement of the moment, as I saw next day when he suddenly died. You were saying that you brought the will to him from his safe. Where was the safe? In the wall over his head. He gave me the key to open it. This key he took from under his pillow. I had no trouble in fitting it or in turning the lock. And what happened after you looked at the will? I put it back, he told me to, but the key I kept. He said I was not to part with it again till the time came for me to produce the will. And when was that to be? Immediately after the funeral. If it so happened that Carlos had arrived in time to attend it, but if for any reason he failed to be here, I was to let it lie till within three days of his return, when I was to take it out in the presence of a Mr. Delahunt, who was to have full charge of it from that time. Oh, I remember all that well enough, and I meant most earnestly to carry out his wishes, but... Go on, Mrs. Quintard, pray go on. What happened? Why couldn't you do what he asked? Because the will was gone when I went to take it out. There was nothing to show Mr. Delahunt but the empty shelf. Oh, a theft. Just a common theft. Someone overheard the talk you had with your brother. But how about the key? You had that. Yes, I had that. Then it was taken from you and returned. You must have been careless as to where you kept it. No, I wore it on a chain about my neck. Though I had no reason to mistrust anyone in the house, I felt that I could not guard this key too carefully. I even kept it on at night. In fact, it never left me. It was still on my person when I went into the room with Mr. Delahunt. But the safe had it opened for all that. There were two keys to it, then. No, 
In giving me the key, my brother has strictly warned me not to lose it, as it had no duplicate. Mrs. Quintard, have you a special confidant or maid? Yes, my Hetty. How much did she know about this key? Nothing, but that it didn't help the fit of my dress. Hetty has cared for me for years. There's no more devoted woman in all New York, nor one who can be more relied upon to tell the truth. She is so honest with her tongue that I am bound to believe her even when she says, What? That it was I and nobody else who took the will out of the safe last night? That she saw me come from my brother's room with a folded paper in my hand, pass with it into the library, and come out again without it? If this is so, then that will is somewhere in that great room. But we've looked in every conceivable place except the shelves, where it is useless to search. It would take days to go through them all, and meanwhile Carlos... We will not wait for Carlos. We will begin work at once. But just one other question. How came Hetty to see you in your walk through the rooms? Did she follow you? Yes, it's it's not the first time I have walked in my sleep. Last night, but she will tell you. It's a painful subject to me. I will send for her to meet us in the library. Will you believe this document to lie hidden? Yes. She had risen and was moving rapidly toward the door. Violet eagerly followed her. Let us accompany her in her passage up the palatial stairway, and realize the effect upon her, of a splendor whose future ownership possibly depended entirely upon herself. It was a cold splendor. The merry voices of children were lacking in these great halls. Death passed and to come infused the air with solemnity and mocked the pomp which yet appeared so much a part of the life here that one could hardly imagine the huge pillared spaces without it. To Violet, more or less accustomed to fine interiors, the chief interest of this one lay in its connection with the mystery then occupying her. Stopping for a moment on the stair, she inquired of Mrs. Quintard if the loss she so deplored had been made known to the servants, and was much relieved to find that with the exception of Mr. Delahunt, she had not spoken of it to any one but Clement. And he would never mention it, she declared, not even to his wife. She has troubles enough to bear without knowing how near she stood to a fortune. Oh, she will have her fortune, Violet confidently replied. In time, the lawyer who drew up the will will appear. But what you want is an immediate triumph over the cold Carlos, and I hope you may have it. Ah! The expletive was a sigh of sheer surprise. Mrs. Quintard had unlocked the library door, and Violet had been given her first glimpse of this, the finest room in New York. She remembered now that she had often heard it so characterized, and indeed had it been taken bodily from some historic abbey of the old world, it could not have expressed more fully, in structure and ornamentation, the Gothic idea at its best. All that it lacked were the associations of vanished centuries, and these, in a measure, were supplied to the imagination by the studied mellowness of its tints and the suggestion of age in its carvings. So much for the room itself, which was but a shelf for holding the great treasure of valuable books ranged along every shelf. As Violet's eyes sped over their ranks and thence to the five windows of deeply stained glass which faced her from the southern end, Mrs. Quintard indignantly exclaimed, And Carlos will turn this into a billiard room. I do not like Carlos, Violet returned hotly. Then remembering herself, hastened to ask whether Mrs. Quintard was quite positive as to this room being the one in which she had hidden the precious document. You had better talk to Hetty said that lady, as a stout woman of most prepossessing appearance entered their presence and paused respectfully just inside the doorway. Hetty, you will answer any questions this young lady may put. If anyone can help us, she can. But first, what news from the sick room? Nothing good. The doctor has just come for the third time today. Mrs. Brooks is crying, and even the children are dumb with fear. I will go. I must see the doctor. I must tell him to keep Clement alive by any means till— She did not wait to say what, but Violet understood and felt her heart grow heavy. Could it be that her employer considered this the gay and easy task she had asked for? The next minute she was putting her first question. Hetty, what did you see in Mrs. Quintard's action last night to make you infer that she left the missing document in this room? The woman's eyes, which had been respectfully studying her face, brightened with relief which made her communicative. With the self-possession of a perfectly candid nature, she inquiringly remarked, My mistress has spoken of her infirmity. 
Yes, and very frankly. She walks in her sleep. So she said. And sometimes when others are asleep and she is not. She did not tell me that. She is a very nervous woman and cannot always keep still when she rouses up at night. When I hear her rise, I get up too. But never being quite sure whether she is sleeping or not, I am careful to follow her at a certain distance. Last night I was so far behind her that she had been to her brother's room and left it before I saw her face. Where is his room and where is hers? Hers is in front of this same floor. Mr. Brooks's is in the rear and can be reached either by the hall or by passing through this room into a small one beyond, which we called his den. Describe your encounter. Where were you standing when you saw her first? In the den I have just mentioned. There was a bright light in the hall behind me, and I could see her figure quite plainly. She was holding a folded paper clenched against her breast, and her movements were so mechanical that I was sure she was asleep. She was coming this way, and in another moment she entered this room. The door, which had been open, remained so, and in my anxiety I crept up to it and looked in after her. There was no light burning here at that hour, but the moon was shining in long rays of variously coloured light. If I had followed her, but I did not. I just stood and watched her long enough to see her pass through a blue ray, then through a green one, and then into, if not through, a red one. Expecting her to walk straight on, and having some fears of the staircase once she got into the hall, I hurried round to the door behind you there to head her off, but she had not yet left this room. I waited and waited, and still she did not come. Fearing some accident, I finally ventured to approach the door and try it. It was locked. This alarmed me. She had never locked herself in anywhere before, and I did not know what to make of it. Some persons would have shouted her name, but I had been warned against doing that, so I simply stood where I was, and eventually I heard the key turn in the lock and saw her come out. She was still walking stiffly, but her hands were empty and hanging at her side. And then? She went straight to her room, and I after her. I was sure she was dead asleep by this time. And she was? Yes, miss, but still full of what was on her mind. I know this because she stopped when she reached the bedside and began fumbling with the waist of her wrapper. It was for the key she was searching, and when her fingers encountered it hanging on the outside, she opened her wrapper and thrust it in on her bare skin. You saw her do all that? As plainly as I see you now, the light in her room was burning brightly. And after that? She got into bed. It was I who turned off the light. Has that wrapper of hers a pocket? No, miss. Nor her gown? No, miss. So she could not have brought the paper into her room concealed about her person? No, miss. She left it here. It never passed beyond this doorway. But might she not have carried it back to some place of concealment in the rooms she had left? The woman's face changed, and a slight flush showed through the natural brown of her cheeks. No, she disclaimed. She could not have done that. I was careful to lock the library door behind her before I ran out into the hall. Then, concluded the Violet, with all the emphasis of conviction, it is here, and nowhere else we must look for that document till we find it. Thus assured of the first step in the task she had before her, Miss Strange settled down to business. The room, which towered to the height of two stories, was in the shape of a huge oval. This oval, separated into narrow divisions for the purpose of accommodating the shelves with which it was lined, narrowed as it rose above the great gothic chimney-piece and the five gorgeous windows looking toward the south, till it met and was lost in the tracery of the ceiling, which was of that exquisite and soul-satisfying order which we see in the Henry the Seventh Chapel in Westminster Abbey. What break otherwise occurred in the circling run of books reaching thus thirty feet or more above the head was made by the two doors already spoken of, and a narrow strip of wall at either end of the space occupied by the windows. No furniture was to be seen there except a couple of stalls taken from some old cathedral, which stood in the two bare places just mentioned. But within, on the extensive floor space, several articles were grouped, and Violet, recognizing the possibilities which any one of them afforded for the concealment of so small an object as a folded document, decided to use method in her search, and to that end, mentally divided the space before her into four segments. The first took in the door, communicating with the suit ending in Mr. Brooks's bedroom. A diagram of this segment will show that the only article of furniture in it was a cabinet. It was of this cabinet Miss Strange made her first stop. 
"'You have looked this world through?' she asked as she bent over the glass case on top to examine the row of medieval missiles displayed within a manner to show their wonderful illuminations. "'Not the case,' explained Hetty. "'It is locked, you see, and no one has yet succeeded in finding the key. But we searched the drawers underneath with the greatest care. Had we sifted the whole contents through our fingers, I could not be more certain that the paper is not there.' Violet stepped into the next segment. This was the one dominated by the huge fireplace. A rug lay before the hearth. To this Violet pointed. Quickly the woman answered, We not only lifted it, but turned it over. And that box at the right? Is full of wood and wood only. Did you take out this wood? Every stick. And those ashes in the fireplace? Something has been burnt here. Yes, but not lately. Besides, those ashes are all wood ashes. If the least bit of charred paper had been mixed with them, we should have considered the matter settled. But you can see for yourself that no such particle can be found. While saying this, she had put the poker into Violet's hand. Rake them about, miss, and make sure. Violet did so, with the result that the poker was soon put back into place, and she herself down on her knees looking up the chimney. Had she thrust it up there, Hetty made haste to remark, there would have been some signs of soot on her sleeves. They are white and very long and are always getting in her way when she tries to do anything. Violet left the fireplace after a glance at the mantel shelf on which nothing stood but a casket of open pret work and two coloured photographs mounted on its small easels. The casket was too open to conceal anything and the photographs lifted too high above the shelf for even the smallest paper, let alone a document of any size, to hide behind them. End of Problem 5 Part 1 The Dreaming Lady Section 7 of The Golden Slipper and Other Problems for Violet Strange. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Golden Slipper and Other Problems for Violet Strange by Anna Catherine Green. Section 7, Problem 5, Part 2 The Dreaming Lady. The chairs, of which there were several in this part of the room, she passed with just an inquiring look. They were all of solid oak, without any attempt at upholstery, and although carved to match the stalls on the other side of the room, offered no place for search. Her delay in the third segment was brief. Here there was absolutely nothing but the door by which she had entered, and the books. As she flitted on, following the oval of the wall, a small frown appeared on her usually smooth forehead. She felt the oppression of the books, the countless books. If, indeed, she should find herself obliged to go through them, what a hopeless outlook! But she had still a segment to consider, and after that the immense table occupying the centre of the room, a table which in its double capacity, for it was as much desk as a table, gave more promise of holding the solution of the mystery than anything else to which she had hitherto given her attention. The quarter in which she now stood was the most beautiful, and possibly the most precious of them all. In it blazed the five great windows which were the glory of the room. But there are no hiding places in windows, and much as she reveled in colour, she dared not waste a moment on them. There was more hope for her in the towering stalls with the possible drawers for books. But Hetty was before her in the attempt she made to lift the lids of the two great seats. "'Nothing in either,' said she, and Violet, with a sigh, turned toward the table." This was an immense affair, made to accommodate itself to the shape of the room, but with a hollowed-out space on the window side large enough to hold a chair for the sitter who would use the stop as a desk. On it were various articles suitable to its double use. Without being crowded, it displayed a pile of magazines and pamphlets, boxes for stationery, a writing pad with its accompaniments, a lamp and some few ornaments, among which was a large box, richly inlaid with pearl and ivory the lid of which stood wide open. Don't touch, admonished Violet, as Hetty stretched out her hand to move some little object aside. You have already worked here busily in the search you made this morning. We handled everything. Did you go through these pamphlets? We shook open each one. We were especially particular here, since it was at this table I saw Mrs. Quintard stop. With head level or drooped? Drooped. Like one looking down, rather than up or around? Yes, a ray of red light shone on her sleeve. It seemed to me the sleeve moved as though she were reaching out. Will you try to stand as she did and as nearly in the same place as possible? 
Hetty glanced down at the table edge, marked where the ghouls dominated the blue and green, and moved to that spot, and paused with her head sinking slowly toward her breast. Very good, exclaimed Violet. But the moon was probably in a very different position from what the sun is now. You are right, it was higher up. I chanced to notice it. Let me come, said Violet. Hetty moved, and Violet took her place but in a spot a step or two farther front. This brought her very near to the center of the table. Hanging her head, just as Hetty had done, she reached out her right hand. Have you looked under this blotter? she asked, pointing toward the pad she touched. I mean between the blotter and the frame which holds it. I certainly did, answered Hetty, with some pride. Violet remained staring down. Then you took off everything that was lying on it. Oh, yes. Violet continued to stare down at the blotter, then impetuously, put them back in their accustomed places. Hetty obeyed. Violet continued to look at them, then slowly stretched out her hand, but soon let it fall again with an air of discouragement. Certainly the missing document was not in the ink pot or the mucilage bottle, yet something made her stoop again over the pad and subject it to the closest scrutiny. If only nothing had been touched, she inwardly sighed, but she let no sign of her discontent escape her lips, simply exclaiming as she glanced up at the towering spaces overhead, The books! The books! Nothing remains but for you to call up all the servants, or get men from the outside, and begin at one end. I should say the upper one. Take down every book standing within reach of a woman of Mrs. Quintard's height. Hear first what Mrs. Quintard has to say about that, interrupted the woman as that lady entered in a flutter of emotion springing from more than one cause. The young lady thinks that we should remove the books, Hetty observed, as her mistress's eye wandered to hers from Violet's abstracted countenance. Useless. If we were to undertake to do that, Carlos would be here before half the job was finished. Besides, Hetty must have told you my extreme aversion to nicely bound books. I will not say that when I wake I never place my hand on one, but once in a state of somnambulism, when every natural whim has full control, I am sure that I never would. There is reason for my prejudice. I was not always rich. I once was very poor. It was when I was first married, and long before Clement had begun to make his fortune. I was so poor then that frequently I went hungry, and what was worse, saw my little daughter cry for food. And why? Because my husband was a bibliomaniac. He would spend on fine editions what would have kept the family comfortable. It is hard to believe, isn't it? I have seen him bring home a grolier when the larder was as empty as that box, and it made me hate books so, especially those of extra fine binding, that I have to tear the covers off before I can find courage to read them. Oh, life, life, how fast Violet was learning it. I can understand your idea, Mrs. Quintard, but as everything else has failed, I should make a mistake not to examine these shelves. It is just possible that we may be able to shorten the task very materially, that we may not have to call in help even. To what extent have they been approached, or the books handled, since you discovered the loss of the paper we are looking for? Not at all. Neither of us went near them. This from Hetty. Nor anyone else. No one else has been admitted to the room. We locked both doors the moment we felt satisfied that the will had been left here. That's a relief. Now I may be able to do something. Hetty, you look like a very strong woman, and I, as you see, am very little. Would you mind lifting me up to these shelves? I want to look at them. Not at the books, but at the shelves themselves. The wandering woman stooped and raised her to the level of the shelf she had pointed out. Violet peered closely at it, and then at the ones just beneath. Am I heavy? she asked. If not, let me see those on the other side of the door. Hetty carried her over. Violet inspected each shelf as high as a woman of Mrs. Quintard's stature could reach, and when on her feet again, knelt to inspect the ones below. No one has touched or drawn anything from these shelves in twenty-four hours, she declared. The small accumulation of dust along their edges has not been disturbed at any point. It was very different with the tabletop. That shows very plainly where you had moved things and where you had not. Was that what you were looking for? Well, I never. Violet paid no heed. She was thinking and thinking very deeply. Hetty turned toward her mistress, then quickly back to Violet, whom she seized by the arm. "'What's the matter with Mrs. Quintard?' she hurriedly asked. "'If it were night, I should think that she was in one of her spells.' Violet started and glanced where Hetty pointed. Mrs. Quintard was within a few feet of them. 
but as oblivious of their presence as though she stood alone in the room. Possibly she thought she did. With fixed eyes and mechanical step, she began to move straight towards the table, her whole appearance of a nature to make Hetty's blood run cold, but to cause that of violets to bound through her veins with renewed hope. The one thing I could have wished, she murmured under her breath. She has fallen into a trance. She is again under the dominion of her idea. If we watch and do not disturb her, she may repeat her action of last night, and herself show where she has put this precious document. Meanwhile, Mrs. Quintard continued to advance. A moment more, and her smooth white locks caught the ruddy glow centred upon the chair standing in the hollow of the table. Words were leaving her lips, and her hand, reaching out over the blotter, groped among the articles scattered there till it settled on a large pair of shears. Listen, muttered Violet to the woman pressing close to her side. You are acquainted with her voice. Catch what she says if you can. Hetty could not, an indistinguishable murmur was all that came to her ears. Violet took a step nearer. Mrs. Quintard's hand had left the shears and was hovering uncertainly in the air. Her distress was evident. Her head, no longer steady on her shoulders, was turning this way and that, and her tones becoming inarticulate. Paper! I want paper! burst from her lips in a shrill, unnatural cry. But when they listened for more and watched to see the uncertain hand settle somewhere, she suddenly came to herself and turned upon them a startled glance, which speedily changed into one of the utmost perplexity. What am I doing here? she asked. I have a feeling as if I had almost seen almost touched oh it's gone and all is blank again why couldn't i keep it till i knew then she came wholly to herself forgetting even the doubts of a moment since remarked to violet in her old tremulous fashion you asked us to put down the books but you've evidently thought better of it yes i have thought better of it then with a last desperate hope of re-arousing the visions lying somewhere back in mrs quintard's troubled brain violet ventured to observe this is likely to resolve itself into a psychological problem, Mrs. Quintard. Do you suppose that if you fell again into the condition of last night, you will repeat your action and so lead us yourself to where the will lies hidden? Possibly. But it may be weeks before I walk again in my sleep, and meanwhile Carlos will have arrived, and Clement possibly died. My nephew is so low that the doctor is coming back at midnight. Miss Strange, Clement is a man in a thousand. He says he wants to see you. Would you be willing to accompany me to his room for a moment? He would not make many more requests, and I will take care that the interview is not prolonged. I will go willingly, but would it not be better to wait? Then you may never see him at all. Very well, but I wish I had some better news to give. That will come later. This house was never meant for Carlos. Hetty, you will stay here. Miss Strange, let us go now. You need not speak. Just let him see you. Violet nodded and followed Mrs. Quintard into the sick room. The sight which met her eyes tried her young emotions deeply. Staring at her from the bed, she saw two piercing eyes over whose brilliance death as yet had gained no control. Clement's soul was in that gaze. Clement halting at the brink of dissolution to sound the depths behind him for the hope which would make departure easy. Would he see in her a mere slip of a girl dressed in fashionable clothes and bearing about her all the marks of social distinction, the sort of person needed for the task upon the success of which depended his darling's future? She could hardly expect it. Yet as she continued to meet his gaze with all the seriousness the moment demanded, she beheld those burning orbs lose some of their demand and their fingers, which had lain inert upon the bedspread, flutter gently and move as if to draw attention to his wife and the three beautiful children clustered at the footboard. He had not spoken, nor could she speak, but the solemnity with which she raised her right hand as to a listening heaven called forth upon his lips what was possibly his last smile, and with the memory of this faint expression of confidence on his part, she left the room to make her final attempt to solve the mystery of the missing document. Facing the elderly lady in the hall, she addressed her with the force and soberness of one leading on fallen hope. I want you to concentrate your mind upon what I have to say to you. Do you think you can do this? I will try, replied the poor woman with a backward glance at the door which had just been closed upon her. What we want, said she, is, as I stated before, an insight into the workings of your brain at the time you took the will from the safe. Try and follow what I have to say, Mrs. Quintard. 
Dreams are no longer regarded by scientists as prophecies of the future or even as spontaneous and irrelevant conditions of thought, but as reflections of a near past which can almost without exception be traced back to the occurrences which caused them. Your action with the will had its birth in some previous line of thought afterwards forgotten. Let us try and find that thought. Recall, if you can, just what you did or read yesterday. Mrs. Quintard looked frightened. But I have no memory, she objected. I forget quickly, so quickly, that in order to fulfill my engagements I have to keep a memorandum of every day's events. Yesterday. Yesterday. What did I do yesterday? I went downtown for one thing, but I hardly know where. Perhaps your memorandum of yesterday's doings will help you. I will get it, but it won't give you the least help. I keep it only for my own eye, and never mind. Let me see it. And she waited impatiently for it to be put in her hands. But when she came to read the record of the last two days, this was all she found. Saturday. Mauritania nearly due. I must let Mr. Delahunt know today that he is wanted here tomorrow. Hetty will try on my dresses. Says she has to alter them. Mrs. Peabody came to lunch, and we in such trouble. Had to go down street. Errand for Clement. The will, the will, I think of nothing else. Is it safe where it is? No peace of mind till tomorrow. Clement's better this afternoon. Says he must live till Carlos gets back, not to triumph over him, but to do what he can to lessen his disappointment. My good Clement. So nervous, I went to pasting photographs and was forgetting all my troubles when Hetty brought in another dress to tie on. Quiet in the great house, during which the clock on the staircase sent forth seven musical peals. To Violet, waiting alone in the library, they act as summons. She was just leaving the room when the sound of hubbub in the hall below held her motionless in the doorway. An automobile had stopped in front, and several persons were entering the house in a gay and unseemly fashion. As she stood listening, uncertain of her duty, she perceived the frenzied figure of Mrs. Quintard approaching. As she passed by, she dropped one word. Carlos. Then she went staggering on to disappear a moment later down the stairway. This vision lost, another came. This time it was that of Clement's wife, leaning from the marble balustrade above, the shadow of approaching grief battling with the present terror in her perfect features. Then she too withdrew from view, and Violet, left for the moment alone in the great hall, stepped back into the library and began to put on her hat. The lights had been turned up in the grand salon, and it was in this scene of gorgeous colour that Mrs. Quintard came face to face with Carlos Palacios. Those who were witness to her entrance say that she presented a noble appearance, as with the resolution of extreme desperation she stood waiting for his first angry attack. He, a short, thick-set, dark man, showing both in features and expression the Spanish blood of his paternal ancestors, started to address her in tones of violence, but changed his note, as he met her eye, to one simply sardonic. You there, he began, I assured you, madame, that it is a pleasure which is not without its inconveniences. Did you not receive my cablegram requesting this house to be made ready for my occupancy? I did. Then why do I find guests here? They do not usually precede the arrival of their host. Clement is very ill, so much the greater reason that he should have been removed. You were not expected for two days yet. You cabled that you were coming on the Mauritania. Yes, I cabled that. Elisabetta. This to his wife, standing silently in the background. We will go to the plaza for tonight. At three o'clock tomorrow, we shall expect to find this house in readiness for our return. Later, if Mrs. Quintard desires to visit us, we shall be pleased to receive her. But, this to Mrs. Quintard herself, you must come without Clement and the kids. Mrs. Quintard's rigid hands stole up to her throat. Clement is dying. He is failing hourly, she murmured. He may not live till morning. Even Carlos was taken aback by this. Oh, well, said he. We will give you two days. Mrs. Quintard gasped, then she walked straight up to him. You will give us all the time his condition requires, and more, much more. He is the real owner of this house, not you. My brother left a will bequeathing it to him. You are my nephew's guests, and not he yours. As his representative, I entreat you and your wife to remain here until you can find a home to your mind. The silence seethed. Carlos had a temper of fire, and so had his wife. But neither spoke till he had gained sufficient control over himself to remark without undue rancor. I did not think you had the wit to influence your brother to this extent. Otherwise, I should have cut my travels short. Then harshly, where is this will? 
it will be produced. But the words faltered. Carlos glanced at the man standing behind his wife, then back at Mrs. Quintard. Wills are not scribbled off on deathbeds, or if they are, it needs something more than a signature to legalize them. I don't believe in this trick of a later will. Mr. Governor, here he indicated the gentleman accompanying them, has done my father's business for years, and he has assured me that the paper he holds in his pocket is the first, last, and only expression of your brother's wishes. If you are in a position to deny this, show us the document you mention. Show us it at once, or inform us where and in whose hands it can be found. That, for, for reasons I cannot give, I must refuse to do it at present. But I am ready to swear a mocking laugh cut her short. Did it issue from his lips or from those of his high-strung and unfeeling wife? It might have come from either. There was cause enough. Oh, she faltered. May God have mercy. And was sinking before their eyes, when she heard her name, called from the threshold. And looking that way, saw Hetty beaming upon her. Backed by a little figure, with a face so radiant, that instinctively her hand went out to grasp the folded sheet of paper Hetty was seeking to thrust upon her. Oh, she cried in a great voice. You will not have to wait, no Clement either. Here is the will. The children have come into their own. And she fell at their feet in a dead faint. Where did you find it? Oh, where did you find it? I have waited a week to know. When, after Carlos's sudden departure, I stood beside Clement's deathbed and saw from the look he gave me that he could still feel and understand, I told him you had succeeded in your task, and that all was well with us. But I was not able to tell him how you had succeeded or in what place the will had been found, and he died, unknowing. But we may know, may we not, now that he is laid away and there is no more talk of our leaving this house. Violet smiled, but very tenderly, and in a way not to offend the mourner. They were sitting in the library, the great library which was to remain in Clement's family after all, and it amused her to follow the dreaming lady's glances as they ran in irrepressible curiosity over the walls. Had Violet wished, she could have kept her secret forever. These eyes would never have discovered it. But she was of a sympathetic temperament, our Violet, so after a moment's delay, during which she satisfied herself that little, if anything, had been touched in the room since her departure from it a week before, she quietly observed, you were right in persisting that you hid it in this room. It was here I found it. Do you notice that photograph on the mantel which does not stand exactly straight on its easel? Yes. Supposing you take it down. You can reach it, can you not? Oh, yes, but what? Lift it down, dear Mrs. Quintard, and then turn it around and look at its back. Agitated and questioning, the lady did as she was bid, and at the first glance gave a cry of surprise, if not of understanding. The square of brown paper, acting as a backing to the picture, was slit across, disclosing a similar one behind it which was still intact. Oh, was it hidden in here? she asked. Very completely, assented Violet, pasted in out of sight by a lady who amuses herself with mounting and framing photographs. Usually she is conscious of her work, but this time she performed her task in a dream. Mrs. Quintard was all amazement. I don't remember touching these pictures, she declared. I never should have remembered. You are a wonderful person, Miss Strange. How came you to think these photographs might have two backings? There was nothing to show that this was so. I will tell you, Mrs. Quintard. You helped me. I helped you? Yes, you remember the memorandum you gave me. In it you mentioned pasting photographs. But this was not enough in itself to lead me to examine those on the mantel. If you had not given me another suggestion a little while before. We did not tell you this, Mrs. Quintard, at the time. But during the search we were making here that day, you had a lapse into that particular state, which induces you to walk in your sleep. It was a short one, lasting but a moment, but in a moment one can speak, and this you did. Spoke? I spoke? Yes, you uttered the word paper. Not the paper, but paper, and reached out towards the shears. Though I had not much time to think of it then, afterwards, upon reading your memorandum, I recall your words and asked myself if it was not paper to cut, rather than to hide, you wanted. If it was to cut, and you were but repeating the experience of the night before, then the room should contain some remnants of cut paper. Had we seen any? Yes, in the basket, under the desk we had taken out and thrown back against a strip or so of wrapping paper, which, if my memory did not fail me, showed a clean-cut edge. To pull this strip out again and spread it flat upon the desk was the work of a minute, and what I saw led me to look all over the room not now for the folded document, but
but for a square of brown paper, such as had been taken out of this larger sheet. Was I successful? Not for a long while, but when I came to the photographs on the mantel and saw how nearly they corresponded in shape and size to what I was looking for, I recalled again your fancy for mounting photographs and felt that the mystery was solved. A glance at the back of one of them brought disappointment, but when I turned about its mate, you know what I found underneath the outer paper. You had laid the will against the original backing and simply pasted another one over it. That the discovery came in time to cut short a very painful interview has made me joyful for a week. And now, may I see the children? End of section 7, problem 5, part 2, The Dreaming Lady Miss Strange was not in a responsive mood. This her employer had observed on first entering, yet he showed no hesitation in lying on the table behind which she had ensconced herself in the attitude of one besieged, an envelope thick with enclosed papers. "'There,' he said. "'Telephone me when you've read them.' "'I shall not read them.' "'No,' he smiled and repossessing himself of the envelope, he tore off one end, extracted the sheets with which it was filled, and laid them down, still folded, in their proper place on the tabletop. The suggestiveness of this action caused the corners of Miss Strange's delicate lips to twitch wistfully before settling into an ironic smile. Calmly the other watched her. "'I am on a vacation.' she loftily explained, as she finally met his studiously non-quizzical glance. "'Oh, I know that I am in my own home,' she petulantly acknowledged, as his gaze took in the room, "'and that the automobile is at the door, and that I'm dressed for shopping, but for all that I am on a vacation, a mental one,' she emphasized, "'and business must wait. I haven't got over the last affair.' she protested, as he maintained a discreet silence. "'And the season is so gay just now, so many balls, so many—' "'But that isn't the worst. Father is beginning to wake up, and if he ever suspects—' A significant gesture ended this appeal. The personage knew her father. Everyone did. And the wonder had always been that she dared run the risk of displeasing one so implacable— though she was his favorite child peter strange was known to be quite capable of cutting her off with a shilling once his closed prejudiced mind conceived it to be his duty and that he would so interpret the situation if he ever came to learn the secret of his daughter's fits of abstraction and the sly bank account she was slowly accumulating the personage holding out this dangerous lure had no doubt at all Yet he only smiled at her words, and remarked in casual suggestion, "'It's out of town this time. Way out. Your health certainly demands a change of air.' "'My health is good, fortunately or unfortunately, as one may choose to look at it. It furnishes me with no excuse for an outing,' she steadily retorted, turning her back on the table. "'Oh, excuse me.' the insidious voice apologized. "'Your paleness misled me. Surely a night or two's change might be beneficial.' She gave him a quick side look, and began to adjust her boa. To this hint he paid no attention. "'The affair is quite out of the ordinary,' he pursued in the tone of one rehearsing a part. But there he stopped. For some reason not altogether apparent to the masculine mind, the pin of the flashing stones, real stones, which held her hat in place, had to be taken out and thrust back again, not once, but twice. It was to watch this performance he had paused. When he was ready to proceed, he took the musing tone of one marshalling the facts for another's enlightenment. A woman of unknown instincts. Pshaw! The end of the pin would strike against the comb holding Violet's chestnut-colored locks. Living in a house, as mysterious as the secret it contains, but— Here he allowed his patience apparently to forsake him, 
I will bore you no longer. Go to your teas and balls. I will struggle with my dark affairs alone. His hand went to the packet of papers she affected so ostentatiously to despise. He could be as nonchalant as she. But he did not lift them. He let them lie. Yet the young heiress had not made a movement or even turned the slightest glance his way. A difficult woman to understand. A mysterious house. Possibly a mysterious crime. Thus Violet kept repeating in silent self-communion, as flushed with dancing she sat that evening in a highly scented conservatory, dividing her tension between the compliments of her partner and the splash of a fountain bubbling in the heart of this mass of tropical foliage. And when, some hours later, she sat down in her chintz-furnished bedroom for a few minutes, thought before retiring, it was to draw from a little oak box at her elbow the half-dozen or so folded sheets of closely written paper which had been left for her perusal by her persistent employer. Glancing first at the signature and finding it to be one already favorably known at the bar, she read with avidity the statement of events thus vouched for, finding them curious enough in all conscience to keep her awake for another full hour. We here subscribe it. I am a lawyer with an office in the Times Square building. My business is mainly local, but sometimes I am called out of town as witness the following summons received by me on the 5th of last October. Dear sir, I wish to make my will. I am an invalid and cannot leave my room. Will you come to me? The enclosed reference will answer for my respectability. If it satisfies you and you decide to accommodate me, please hasten your visit. I have not many days to live. A carriage will meet you at Highland Station at any hour you designate. Telegraph. Reply. A. Postlewaite. Gloom Cottage. New Jersey. The reference given was a Mr. Weed of 86th Street, a well-known man of unimpeachable reputation. Calling him up at his business office, I asked him what he could tell me about Mr. Postlewaite of Gloom Cottage, New Jersey. The answer astonished me. There is no Mr. Apostle Waite to be found at that address. He died years ago. There is a Mrs. Apostle Waite, a confirmed paralytic. Do you mean her? I glanced at the letter, still lying open at the side of the telephone. The signature reads, A. Apostle Waite. Then it's she. Her name is Arabella. She hates the name. Being a woman of no sentiment, uses her initials even on her checks. What does she want of you? To draw her will. Oblige her. It'll be experience for you. And he slammed home the receiver. I decided to follow the suggestion so forcibly emphasized, and the next day saw me at Highland Station. A superannuated horse and a still more superannuated carriage awaited me, both too old to serve a busy man in these days of swift conveyance, could this be a sample of the establishment I was about to enter? Then I remembered that the woman who had sent for me was a helpless invalid and probably had no use for any sort of turnout. The driver was in keeping with the vehicle and as noncommittal as the plodding beast he drove. If I ventured upon a remark, he gave me a long and curious look. If I went so far as to attack him with a direct question, he responded with a hitch of his shoulder or a dubious smile which conveyed nothing. Was he deaf or just unpleasant? I learned that he was not deaf, for suddenly, after a jog-trot of a mile or so through a wooded road which we had entered from the main highway, he drew in his horse and, without glancing my way, he spoke his first word. "'This is where you get out.' The house is back there, in the bushes. As no house was visible, and the bushes rose in an unbroken barrier along the road, I stared at him in some doubt of his sanity. But, I began, a protest in which he at once broke with the sharp direction. Take the path. It'll lead you straight to the front door. I don't see any path. For this he had no answer and confident from his expression that it would be useless to expect anything further from him, I dropped a coin into his hand and jumped to the ground. 
He was off before I could turn myself about. Hmm. Something is rotten in the state of Denmark. I quoted in a startled comment to myself, and not knowing what else to do, stared down at the turf at my feet. A bit of flagging met my eye, protruding from a layer of thick moss. Further on I espied another, the second probably of many. This, no doubt, was the path I had been bidden to follow, and, without further thought on the subject, I plunged into the bushes which, with difficulty, I made give way before me. For a moment all further advance looked hopeless. A more tangled, uninviting approach to a so-called home I had never seen outside the tropics, and the complete neglect thus displayed should have prepared me for the appearance of the house I unexpectedly came upon, just as the way seemed on the point of closing before me. But nothing could well prepare one for the first view of Gloom Cottage. Its location, in a hollow which had gradually filled itself up with trees and some kind of prickly brush, its deeply stained walls once picturesque enough in their grouping but too deeply hidden now amid rotting boughs to produce any other effect other than that of shrouded desolation, the so of these same boughs as they wrapped a devil's tattoo against each other, and the absence of even the rising column of smoke which bespeaks domestic life wherever seen, all gave to one who remembered the cognomen cottage and forgot the precognomen of gloom, a sense of buried life as sepulchre as that which emanates from the mouth of some freshly opened tomb. But these impressions, natural enough to my youth, were necessarily transient, and soon gave way to others more businesslike. Perceiving the curve of an arch rising above the undergrowth still blocking my approach, I pushed my way resolutely through, and presently found myself stumbling upon the steps of an unexpectedly spacious domicile, built not of wood, as the name cottage had led me to expect, but of carefully cut stone which, while showing every mark of time, proclaimed itself one of those early, carefully erected colonial residences, which it takes more time than a century to destroy or even wear to the point of dilapidation. Somewhat encouraged, though failing to detect any signs of active life in the heavily shuttered windows frowning upon me from either side, I ran up the steps and rang the bell, which pulled as hard as if no hand had touched it in years. Then I waited. But not to ring again, for just as my hand was approaching the bell a second time, the door fell back and I beheld in the black gap before me the oldest man I had ever come upon in my whole life. He was so old, I was astonished when he drew his lips open and asked if I was the lawyer from New York. I would as soon have expected a mummy to wag its tongue and utter English. He looked so thin and dried and removed from this life and all worldly concerns. But when I had answered his question and he had turned to marshal me down the hall towards a door I could dimly see standing open in the twilight of an absolutely sunless interior. I noticed that his step was not without some vigor, despite the feeble bend of his withered body and the incessant swaying of his head which seemed to be continually saying, No, I will prepare, madam, he admonished me after drawing a ponderous curtain two inches or less aside from one of the windows. She is very ill, but she will see you. The tone was senile, but it was the senility of an educated man, and as the cultivated accents waver forth, my mind changed in regard to the position he held in the house. Interested anew, I sought to give him another look, but he had already vanished through the doorway, and noiselessly it was more like a shadow flitting than a man's withdrawal. The darkness in which I sat was absolute, but gradually, as I continued to look about me, the spaces lightened and certain details came out, 
which, to my astonishment, were of a character to show that the plain, if substantial, exterior of this house, with its choked-up approaches and weedy gardens, was no sample of what was to be found inside. Though the walls surrounding me were dismal, because unlighted, they betrayed a splendor unusual in any country home. The frescoes and paintings were of an ancient order, dating from days when life, and not death, reigned in this isolated dwelling. But in them high art reigned supreme, an art so high and so finished that only great wealth combined with the most cultivated taste could have produced such effects. I was still absorbed in the wonder of it all when the quiet voice of the old gentleman who had let me in reached me again from the doorway, and I heard, "'Madam is ready for you. May I trouble you to accompany me to her room?' I rose with alacrity. I was anxious to see Madam, if only to satisfy myself that she was as interesting as the house in which she was self immured I found her a great deal more so. But before I enter upon our interview, let me mention a fact which had attracted my attention in my passage to her room. During his absence, my guide evidently had pulled aside other curtains than those of the room in which he had left me. The hall, no longer a tunnel of darkness, gave me a glimpse as we went by of various secluded corners, and it seemed as if everywhere I looked I saw a clock. I counted four before we reached the staircase, all standing on the floor and all of ancient make, though differing much in appearance and value. The fifth one rose grim and tall at the stair foot, and under an impulse I have never understood I stopped when I reached it to note the time. But it had paused in its task, and faced me with motionless hands and silent works, a fact which somehow startled me, perhaps because just then I encountered the old man's eye watching me with an expression as challenging as it was unintelligible. I had expected to see a woman in bed. I saw, instead, a woman sitting up. You felt her influence the moment you entered her presence. She was not young. She was not beautiful. Never had been I should judge— she had not the usual marks about her of an ultra-strong personality, but that her will was law, had always been, and would continue to be law so long as she lived, was patent to any eye at first glance. She exacted obedience consciously and unconsciously, and she exacted it with charm. So few people in the world possess this power. They frown and the opposing will weakens. They smile, and all hearts succumb. I was hers from the moment I crossed the threshold till, but I will relate the happenings of that instant when it comes. She was alone, or so I thought, when I made my first bow to her stern but not unpleasing presence, seated in a great chair with a silver tray before her containing such little matters as she stood in hourly need of, she confronted me with a piercing gaze, startling to behold, in eyes so colorless. Then she smiled, and in obedience to that smile I seated myself in a chair placed very near her own. Was she too paralyzed to express herself clearly? I waited in some anxiety till she spoke, when this fear vanished. Her voice betrayed the character her features failed to express. It was firm, resonant, and instinct with command, not loud, but penetrating, and of all quality which made one listen with his heart as well as with his ears. What she said is immaterial, I was there for a certain purpose, and we entered immediately upon the business of that purpose. She talked, and I listened, mostly without comment. Only once did I interrupt her with a suggestion, and as this led to definite results. I will proceed to relate the occurrence in full. In the few hours remaining to me before leaving New York, 
I had learned, no matter how, some additional particulars concerning herself and family, and when, after some minor bequest, she proceeded to name the parties to whom she desired to leave the bulk of her fortune, I ventured, with some astonishment of my own temerity, to remark— "'But you have a young relative. "'Is she not to be included in this partition of your property?' "'A hush. "'Then a smile came to life on her stiff lips, "'such as is seldom seen, thank God, on the face of any woman. "'And I heard, "'The young woman of whom you speak is in the room.' She has known for some time that I have no intention of leaving anything to her. There is, in fact, small chance of her ever needing it. The latter sentence was a muttered one, but it was loud enough to be heard in all parts of the room. I was soon assured, for a quick sigh, which was almost a gasp, followed from a corner I had hitherto ignored, and upon glancing that way I perceived peering upon us from the shadow the white face of a young girl in whose drawn features and wide staring eyes I beheld such evidence of terror that in an instant whatever predilection I had hitherto felt for my client vanished in distrust, if not positive aversion. I was still under the sway of this new impression when Mrs. Postulate's voice rose again. "'You may go,' she said with such force in the command for all of its honeyed modulation that I expected to see the object fly the room in frightened obedience. But though the startled girl had lost most of the terror which had made her face like a mask, no power of movement remained to her, a picture of hopeless misery." She stood for one breathless moment, with her eyes fixed in an unmistakable appeal on mine. Then she began to sway helplessly that I leapt with bounding heart to catch her. As she fell into my arms, I heard her sigh as before. No common anguish spoke in that sigh. I had stumbled unwittingly upon a tragedy, to the meaning of which I held but a doubtful key. She seems very ill. I observed with some emphasis, as I turned to lay my helpless burden on a nearby sofa. "'She's doomed!' The words were spoken with gloom, and with an attempt at communication which no longer rang true in my ears. "'She's as sick as a woman as I am myself,' continued Mrs. Postlewaite. "'That is why I made the remark I did.' never imagining she would hear me at that distance. Do not put her down. My nurse will be here in a moment to relieve you of your burden. A tinkle accompanied these words. The resolute woman had stretched out a finger, of whose use she was not quite deprived, and touched a little bell standing on the tray before her, an inch or two from her hand. Pleased to obey her command, I paused at the sofa's edge, and taking advantage of the momentary delay, studied the youthful countenance pressed unconsciously to my breast. It was one whose appeal lay less in its beauty, though that was a touching quality, than in the story it told, a story which, for some unaccountable reason, I did not pause to determine what one. I felt it to be my immediate duty to know, but I asked no question then. I did not even venture to comment, and yielded her up with seeming readiness with a strong but none too intelligent woman came running in with arms outstretched to carry her off. When the door had closed upon these two, the silence of my client drew my attention back to herself. "'I am waiting,' was her quiet observation, and without any further reference to what had just taken place under our eyes, she went on with the business previously occupying us. I was able to do my part without any too great display of my own disturbance. The clearness of my remarkable client's instructions, 
the definiteness with which her mind was made up as the disposal of every dollar of her vast property made it easy for me to master each detail and make careful note of every wish. But this did not prevent the ebb and flow within me of an undercurrent of thought full of question and uneasiness. What had been the real purport of the scene to which I had just been made a surprise witness? The few but certainly unusual facts which had been given me in regard to the extraordinary relations existing between the two closely connected women will explain the intensity of my interest. Those facts shall be yours. Arabella Merwin, when young, was gifted with a particular fascination which, as we have seen, had not altogether vanished with age. Consequently, she had many lovers, among them two brothers, Frank and Andrew Postlewaite. The latter was the older, the handsomer, and the most prosperous. His name is remembered yet in connection with South American schemes of large importance. But it was Frank she married. That real love, ardent if unreasonable, lay at the bottom of her choice, is evident enough to those who followed the career of the young couple. But it was a jealous love, which brooked no rival, and, as Frank postulate was of an impulsive and erratic nature, scenes soon occurred between them which, while revealing the extraordinary force of the young wife's character, led to no serious break until after her son was born, and this notwithstanding the fact that Frank had long given up making a living, and that they were openly dependent on their wealthy brother, now fast approaching the millionaire status. This brother, the Peruvian king, as some called him, must have been an extraordinary man. Though cherishing his affection for the spirited Arabella to the point of remaining a bachelor for her sake, he betrayed none of the usual signs of disappointed love, but on the contrary, made every effort to advance her happiness, not only by assuring to herself and husband an adequate income, but by doing all he could in other and less open ways to lessen any sense she might entertain of her mistake in preferring for her life-mate this self-centered and unstable brother. She should have adored him, but though she evinced gratitude enough, there is nothing to prove that she ever gave Frank postulate the least cause to cherish any other sentiment towards his brother than that of honest love and unqualified respect. Perhaps he never did cherish any other. Perhaps the change which everyone saw in the young couple immediately after the birth of their only child was due to another cause. Gossip is silent on this point. All that it insists upon is that, from the time evidences of the growing estrangement between them became so obvious that even the indulgent Andrew could not blind himself to it, showing his sense of trouble not by lessening their income, for that he doubled, but by spending more time in Peru and less in New York where the two were living. However, and here we enter upon those details which I have ventured to characterize as uncommon, he was in this country and in the actual company of his brother when the accident occurred which terminated both their lives. It was the old story of a skidding motor and Mrs. Postlewaite having been sent for in a great haste to the small inn into which the two injured men had been carried, arrived only in time to witness their last moments. Frank died first, and Andrew some few minutes later, an important fact, as was afterwards shown when the latter's will came to be read. This was a peculiar one. By its provision, the bulk of the king's great property was left to his brother Frank. But, with this especial stipulation that in case his brother failed to survive him, the full legacy, as bequeathed to him, should be given unconditionally to his widow. Frank's demise, as I have already stated, preceded his brother's by several minutes, 
and, consequently, Arabella became the chief legatee, and that is how she obtained her millions. But, and here a startling feature comes in, when the will came to be administered, the secret underlying the break between Frank and his wife was brought to light by a revelation of the fact that he had practiced a great deception upon her at the time of his marriage. Instead of being a bachelor, as was currently believed, he was, in reality, a widower and the father of a child. This fact, so long held secret, had become hers when her own child was born, and constituted as she was, she not only never forgave the father, but conceived such a hatred for the innocent object of their quarrel that she refused to admit its claim or even acknowledge its existence. But later, after his death, in fact, she showed some sense of obligation toward one who, under ordinary conditions, would have shared her wealth. When the whole story became heard, and she discovered that this secret had been kept from his brother as well as from her, and that consequently no provision had been made in any way for the child thus thrown directly upon her mercy, she did the generous thing and took the forsaken girl into her own home. But she never betrayed the least love for her, her whole heart being bound up in her own boy who was, as all agree, a prodigy of talent. But this boy, for all his promise and seeming strength of constitution, died when barely seven years old, and the desolate mother was left with nothing to fill her heart but the uncongenial daughter of her husband's first wife. The fact that this child, slighted as it had hitherto been, would, in the event of her uncle having passed away before her father, have been the undisputed heiress of a large portion of the wealth now at the disposal of her arrogant stepmother, led many to expect, now that the boy was no more, that Mrs. Postulate would proceed to acknowledge the little Helena as her heir, and give her that place in the household to which her natural claims entitled her. But no such result followed passion of grief into which the mother was thrown by the shipwreck of all her hopes left her hard and implacable and when as very soon happened she fell victim to the disease which tied her to her chair and made the wealth which had come to her by such a peculiar ordering of circumstances little less than a mockery even in her own eyes it was upon this child she expended the full fund of her secret bitterness and the child? What of her? How did she bear her unhappy fate when she grew old enough to realize it? With the resignation, which was the wonder of all who knew her, no murmurs escaped her lips, nor was the devotion she invariably displayed to the exacting invalid who ruled her, as well as all the rest of her household, with a rod of iron, ever disturbed by the least sign of reproach. Though the riches which in those early days poured into the home in a measure far beyond the needs of its mistress were expended in making the house beautiful rather than in making the one young life within it happy. She never was heard to utter so much as a wish to leave the walls within which fate had immured her. Content or seemingly content with the only home she knew, she never asked for change or demanded friends or amusements. Visitors ceased coming. Desolation followed neglect. The garden, once a glory, succumbed to the riot of weeds and undesirable brush, till a towering wall seemed to be drawn about the house, cutting it off from the activities of the world as it cut it off from the approach of sunshine by day and the comfort of starlit heaven by night. And yet the young girl continued to smile, though with a pitifulness of late, which seemed thought betokened secret terror, and others the wasting of a body too sensitive for such unwholesome seclusion. These were the facts, known if not consciously specialized, which gave the latter part of my interview with Mrs. Postlewaite 
a poignancy of interest which had never attended any of my former experiences. The peculiar attitude of Miss Postlewaite toward her indirect tormentor awakened in my agitated mind something much deeper than curiosity, but when I strove to speak her name with the intent of inquiring more particularly into her condition, such a look confronted me from the steady eye immovably fixed upon my own, that my courage, or was it my natural precaution, bade me subdue the impulse and risk no attempt which might betray the depth of my interest in one so completely outside the scope of my present moment's business. Perhaps Mrs. Postlewaite appreciated my struggle. Perhaps she was wholly blind to it. There was no reading the mind of this woman of sentimental name but inflexible nature, and realizing the fact more fully with every word she uttered, I left her at last with no further betrayal of my feelings than might be evinced by the earnestness with which I promised to return for her signature at the earliest possible moment. This she had herself requested, saying, as I rose, I can still write my name if the paper is pushed carefully along under my hand. See to it that you come while the power remains to me. I had hoped that in my passage downstairs I might run upon someone who would give me news of Miss Postlewaite, but the woman who approached to conduct me downstairs was not of an appearance to invite confidence, and I felt forced to leave the house with my doubts unsatisfied. Two memories, equally distinct, followed me. One was the picture of Mrs. Postlewaite's fingers groping among her belongings on the little tray perched on her lap, and another of the intent and strangely bent figure of the old man who had acted as my usher, listening to the ticking of one of the great clocks. So absorbed was he in this occupation that he not only failed to notice me when I went by, but he did not even lift his head at my cheery greeting. Such mysteries were too much for me, and led me to postpone my departure from town till I had sought out Mrs. Postlewaite's doctor and propounded to him one or two leading questions. First, would Mrs. Postlewaite's present condition be likely to hold till Monday? And, secondly, was the young lady living with her as ill as her stepmother said? He was a mild old man of an easy-going type, and the answers I got from him were far from satisfactory. Yet he showed some surprise when I mentioned the extent of Mrs. Postlewaite's anxiety about her stepdaughter, and paused in a dubious shaking of his head to give me a short stare in which I read as much determination as perplexity. I will look into Miss Postlewaite's case more particularly, were his parting words, and with this one gleam of comfort I had to be content. Monday's interview was a brief one, and contained nothing worth repeating. Mrs. Postlewaite listened with stoical satisfaction to the reading of the will I had drawn up, and upon its completion rang her bell for the two witnesses awaiting her summons in an adjoining room. They were not of her household, but to all appearance honest villagers, but with one noticeable characteristic, an overweening idea of Mrs. Postlewaite's importance. Perhaps the spell she had so liberally woven for others in other and happier days was felt by them at this hour. It would not be strange. I had almost fallen under it myself. So great was the fascination of her manner, even in this wreck of her bodily powers, when triumph assured, she faced us all in a state of complete satisfaction. But before I was again quit of the place, all my doubts returned, and in fuller force than ever. I had lingered in my going as much as decency would permit, hoping to hear a step on the stair or see a face in some doorway which would contradict Mrs. Postlewaite's cold assurance that Miss Postlewaite was no better. But no such step did I hear, and no face did I see, save the old old one of the ancient friend or relative, whose bent frame seemed continually to haunt the halls. 
As before, he stood listening to the monotonous ticking of one of the clocks, muttering to himself, and quite oblivious of my presence. However, this time I decided not to pass him without a more persistent attempt to gain his notice. Pausing at his side, I asked him, in a friendly tone, I thought was best calculated to attract his attention, how Miss Postlewaite was today. He was so intent upon his task, whatever that was, that while he turned my way, it was with a glance as blank as that of a stone image. Listen, he admonished me. It says, no, no. I don't think it will ever say anything else. I stared at him in some consternation, then at the clock itself, which was the tall one I had found run down at my first visit. There was nothing unusual in its quiet tick, so far as I could hear, and with a compassionate glance at the old man who had turned breathlessly again to listen, proceeded on my way without another word. The old fellow was daft, a century old and daft. I had worked my way out through the vines which still encumbered the porch, and was taking my first steps down the walk when some impulse made me turn and glance up at one of the windows. Did I bless the impulse? I thought I had every reason for doing so, when through a network of interlacing branches I beheld the young girl with whom my mind was wholly occupied, standing with her head thrust forward, watching the descent of something small and white which she had just released from her hand. A note, a note written by her and meant for me, with a grateful look in her direction, which was probably lost upon her as she was already drawn back out of sight, I sprang for it only to meet with disappointment, for it was no billet doux I received from amid the clustering brush where it had fallen, but a small square of white cloth showing a line of fantastic embroidery. Annoyed beyond measure, I was about to fling it down again, when the thought that it had come from her hand deterred me and I thrust it into my vest pocket. When I took it out again, which was soon after I had taken my seat in the car, I discovered what a mistake I should have made if I had followed my first impulse, for upon examining the stitches more carefully, I perceived that what I had considered mere decorative pattern was in fact a string of letters, and that these letters made words, and that these words were... I D O N O T W A N T T O D I E B U T I S U R E L Y W I L L I F, or in plain writing, I do not want to die, but I surely will if. Finish the sentence for me. That is the problem I offer you. It is not a case for the police, but one well worth your attention. If you succeed in reaching the heart of this mystery and saving this young girl, only let no delay occur. The doom, if doom it is, is eminent. Remember that the will is signed. She is too small. I did not ask you to send me a midget. Thus spoke Mrs. Postlewaite to her doctor as he introduced into her presence a little figure in a nurse's cap and apron. You said to me, you said I needed care, more care than I was receiving. I answered that my old nurse could give it, and you objected that she or someone else must look after Miss Postlewaite. I did not see the necessity, but I never contradict a doctor. So I yielded to your wishes, but not without the provisio. You remember that I made a provisio. That whatever sort of young woman you chose to introduce into this room, she should not be fresh from the training schools, and that she should be strong, silent, and capable. And you bring me this might of a woman. Is she a woman? 
She looks more like a child, of pleasing countenance enough, but who can no more lift me? Pardon me. Little Miss Strange had advanced. I think if you will allow me the privilege, madam, that I can shift you into a much more comfortable position. And with the deftness and ease certainly not to be expected from one of her slight physique, Violet raised the helpless invalid a trifle more upon her pillow. The act, its manner, and the smile accompanying it could not fail to please, and undoubtedly did, though no word rewarded her from the lips not so much given to speech save when the occasion was imperative, but Mrs. Postlewaite made no further objection to her presence, and, seeing this, the doctor's countenance relaxed, and he left the room with a much lighter step than with which he had entered it. And thus it was that Violet Strange, an adept in more ways than one, became installed at the bedside of this mysterious woman whose days, if numbered, still held possibilities of action which those interested in young Helena Postlewaite's fate would do well to recognize. Miss Strange had been at her post for two days, and had gathered up the following. That Mrs. Postlewaite must be obeyed. That her stepdaughter, who did not wish to die, would die if she knew it to be the wish of this domineering but apparently idolized woman. That the old man of the clocks, while senile in some regards, was very alert and quite youthful in others. If a century old which she began greatly to doubt, he had the language and the manner of one in his prime, when unaffected by the neighborhood of the clocks, which seemed to be in some non-understandable way to exercise an occult influence over him. At table he was an entertaining host, but neither there nor elsewhere would he discuss the family or dilate in any way upon the peculiarities of a household of which he had manifestly regarded himself as the least important member. Yet no one knew them better, and when Violet became quite assured of this, as well as the futility of looking for explanation of any kind from either of her two patients, she resolved upon an effort to surprise one from him. She went about it this way. Noting his custom of making a complete round of the clocks each night after dinner, she took advantage of Mrs. Postlewaite's inclination to sleep at this hour, to follow him from clock to clock in the hope of overhearing some portion of the monologue with which he bent his head to the swinging pendulum, or put his ear to the hidden works. Soft-footed and discreet, she tripped along at his back and at each pause he made, paused herself, and turned her ear his way. The extreme darkness of the halls, which were more somber by night than by day, favored this attempt, and she was able, after a failure or two, to catch the no, 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 which fell from his lips in seeming repetition of what he heard most of them say. The satisfaction in his tone proved that the denial to which he listened chimed in with his hopes and gave ease to his mind. But he looked his oldest when, after pausing at another of the many timepieces, he echoed in answer to its special refrain, Yes, 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 and fled the spot with shaking body and a distracted air. The same fear and the same shrinking were observable in him as he returned from listening to the least conspicuous one, standing in a short corridor where Violet could not follow him. But when, after a hesitation which enabled her to slip behind the curtain hiding the drawing-room door, he approached and laid his ear against the great one standing, as if on guard, at the foot of the stairs, she saw by the renewed vigor he displayed that there was comfort for him in its message, even before she caught the whisper with which he left it and proceeded to mount the stairs. It says no! It says no! 
I will heed it as the voice of heaven. But one conclusion could be the result of such an experiment to the mind like violets. This partly touched old man not only held the key to the secret of this house, but was in a mood to divulge it if he could be induced to hear command instead of dissuasion in the tick of this one large clock. But how could he be induced? Violet returned to Mrs. Postlewaite's bedside in a mood of extreme thoughtfulness. End of Section 8, Problem 6, The House of Clocks, Part 1 Recorded by Deborah Maddock